Um, oops, there's, oh, there we go. Um, so just a few words about Noah. So actually I'll stop sharing um, and huge thanks to Noah for sharing his time with us this evening. He's got a family and has plenty of other ways to <laughs> spend his time. So we really appreciate that. So you can go ahead and share your screen, Noah. Um, so Noah is assistant professor of conservation biology at the University of Maine in research, writing and teaching. The work at his lab at UMO spans landscape ecology, conservation biology, natural history, public policy and environmental education. Um, he wrote the book, These Trees Tell a Story, which brings readers into the field as naturalists to understand the many interconnected layers of environmental studies. He also co-authored Tracks and Signs of Insects and Other Invertebrates, A Guide to North American Species, which won several awards. And on the side, um, when he's not doing all of those other things, he runs a nonprofit conservation organization and helps run a jazz club, both in Nashville, Tennessee. I don't know how you do that from, <laughs> from Maine, but kudos. Um, and I just want to say that um, I heard Noah on Maine Calling um, a while ago, um, immediately ran out to buy his book, um, and I loved it. Um, I pulled it out last night and started enjoying it all over again. So um, I'm really excited to hear his presentation. So um, so let's move on to uh, see what Noah has to say. Take it away. All right. Thanks so much. Can you see my screen and hear and everything? Yes. Like... Yep. It looks perfect. All right. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Just stop me if something goes awry. Um, thank you so much. Really excited to be here talking with you all and looking at that uh, that intro you gave us looks like you get a lot of a lot of great stuff you're doing there and and excited to see the kids getting involved with with nature out there obviously as you'll find out that's a lot of like what I'm in, excited about getting kids outside and experiencing the world and and if you'll notice behind me I have two of my children my two children who are prominent in the book but they're back there playing with Legos so if you hear any little clinking sounds you'll know what that is um it's Juno and all they're back there um so yeah, thanks for uh, having me, and thanks for sort of taking the time to listen to the story a little bit. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be talking about this book, which uh, it's now out on Audible. If you guys don't like reading but like listening, I listened to the whole thing while I was falling asleep at night for a while. It helped put me to sleep if you want some bedtime reading. Uh, but it's it's uh, there's another route there for you to get it. And I guess I'd also say, clicker isn't working. Um, if you haven't bought the book yet, the Yale just gave me this code NC tree 0024. If you go and we can send this out later, but it's 30% off the book if you buy it from Yale using that code. So if you want a little discount and buying it, you can you can use that there and, and we can send that out later too. Um, all right. Uh, so I want to start my story, I guess, in Nashville, where I'm from. Uh, and while I was writing this book, I traveled around a lot. And one of the places I went was to my friend's farm in out just outside of Nashville, actually, where, you know, he uh, grows soybeans and he was he had recently done some prescribed burning for um, for some birds there. And he was he's this really great naturalist and he has all these trail cameras up and he was walking me around the land. And I was actually pushing my two kids in the double stroller at the time. And, you know, we're walking along these uh, dirt sort of wide roads wide enough for his like pickup truck to bounce along. Um, and we were walking down through the soybean fields down to the river, saw some raccoon tracks in the mud and and then walked up to the edge of this field and the sort of the field forest edge there. Um, where there was this intersection between the like two dirt roads basically at the edge of the forest. And uh, John is actually up there ahead of me. He's at the intersection, like 30 meters up ahead. And I'm back with the two kids in the double stroller. And he calls back to me and he says, hey, hey, Noah, there's a there's a scat here. I want you to look at it, you know, because he knows that like I like poop and stuff. And so he thought I'd get a kick out of it. And and he's like, hey, no, I, I think I, I, I think it's a, a raccoon scat. And, um, you know, because he had actually seen it the day before. And he'd taken a picture of it, brought it back to Google Images and compared side by side and said, yeah, it looks like a raccoon scat. And now I'm back there 30 meters away and and I can't see the thing. I'm behind the double stroller like pushing the kids. Um, but I know it's not a raccoon scat. And, you know, sure enough, like a raccoon probably have walked by that point and recently the ra and and maybe even that same raccoon we saw tracks of. But 
the thing is the raccoon th that's just not where she would put her scat they they have a particular place they put their scat which is like often like on the uphill side of a hemlock in a little latrine down by the creek there or somewhere like that um that placement in the middle of a trail at the trail intersection and, and like next to a forest field edge it's just not where raccoons place their scats um that's where a coyote would put its cat. And I can, without even seeing the thing, I know that that's probably what it's gonna be. Um, and, uh, you know, I got up to it eventually and looked at it and sure enough, it was a coyote scat. It looked a little funny and been eating apples, so it got a little mushy and stuff. But, you know, John's mistake was, um, Sue Moore says a saying that if you're, when you tra half of tracking is uh, knowing where to look, the other half is looking there. Nowhere in that maxim is like, what does the thing look like? And so if you're going to identify a track or a scat, track or a scat, you don't start by looking at the thing. You start by looking at the context around. And so John's mistake was he started by looking at the scat and started looking at the, what is the context? What's the ecological context? What is the setting? Every animal has their particular way of marking a particular place of putting putting scat in this case. And uh, it's all about that context and what's around. Um, so for about what 15 years or so, almost 20 years now, I've been working on this little side nonprofit thing uh, in Nashville where we've been doing conservation planning and various different nonprofit capacities. And I've been part of this uh, open space plan that was developed and passed through the Metro Council in 2015. I was only a very tiny part of this. I can't claim credit for it, but broadly, like we were uh, supportive of this um, idea. And what we were looking at in Nashville, it's a, it's a, if anyone's been to Nashville, it's one of the largest land area cities in the whole country. And it's got, I think like, I always get this wrong. I think it's 250 square miles of closed canopy forest within the or like metro limits. So it's it's got a lot of cool forest there. Um, old forest. And what we've done here is sort of mapped out the core conservation target areas and the corridors linking between those uh, those different conservation areas. So this is officially adopted as the metro policy as sort of what we're trying to do with uh, planning in, in the city. So I want to zoom in on, let's see, where is it? Richland Creek Corridor, which I, if you can see my mouse is right here. Uh, and this right here is Richland Creek. And this is what I call the Nito Bridgeway. Um, when I was a kid, my mom used to drive me, pick me up from school and drive me down this road and we would turn right and go over the railroad here. Now you you can see that the road doesn't connect anymore. It used to be able to, you used to be able to drive across the railroad, but they cut off that end of it. So anyway, back in the day, you used to be able to drive across the railroad and drive to this, the Nito Bridgeway. And my mom would stop the car and she'd say, get out and count the turtles. And I would look over the bridge and see how many turtles I could see from standing on, on the edge of the bridge there. And I would see sometimes dozens of turtles, uh, mat turtles, soft shell turtles, box turtles, turtles that, you know, snapping turtles. Um, many of those species are today on the official list of species in greatest need of conservation in the state of Tennessee. These are species we're like really officially trying to protect in a, of conservation concern. And this is one of my favorite wildlife viewing spots ever. Um, you know, green herons and great blue herons, all sorts of cool stuff there. And uh, so a few years ago, I, I went to take my kids back to experience this sacred part of my childhood to the Nito Bridgeway to count the turtles. And we drive down there in the car, get up to the end of the road, the road that end that, you know, is still connected. And we find this sign. And I'm like, wait, what do you mean? Closed road. This is a public road. How can it be closed? And I did a little digging. And it turns out that um, the city of Nashville literally gave this road away to the two abutting landowners for free. Um, and this played out over, it was actually a two stage process over two different years. And in each of those years, it went through five different committees, three re separate readings of Metro Council, twice for each of these things. And apparently nowhere along the way did anybody sort of raise their hand and say, like, wait a minute, uh, this isn't a good idea. We've got like, Conservation is fighting tooth and nail to protect places like this. This is a map part of our open space plan. Like we shouldn't just give it away. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't really. My point isn't to fault these decision makers. Some of them actually are work with us on our nonprofit, are very well intentioned, important, good people that are have want to see the environment conserved. Um, but they're looking at maps that look like this. This is what they're given. This is how we make the decisions. And this is a plat, a black and white map that, flat map that sort of shows 
you know, parcel boundaries and traffic flow. And remember how this is now a dead end road. So from a traffic perspective, yeah, this road has no value. So let's just give it away. Obviously, what's not mapped on here is the sort of conservation uh, values, the ecological context, the flow of the, the ecology, environmental flows across that road. And we're not thinking about the surrounding parcels and, and what, is, what is the context in an environmental way. And I think that's sort of at the core of a lot of our, our problems. We make these decisions from uh, sort of what I call the forest of drywall there without any experience of the real forest or of the environment that, we're, that our decisions affect. And increasingly these days, you know, we don't need to think about the space around us. If we want to drive across a state or a country, we'll just go to get groceries. We don't, we no longer think about where we're going. We just sort of plug it into our phone and we, our phone tells us where to turn and we don't have to have any map of the space that we're moving through in our head. We, we don't know how to use maps anymore. I, 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 uh, for my dissertation, I went to all these vernal pools in the Berkshires and like follow the GPS the whole time. And when I go back now, I don't have a spatial map of where these things are in my head because I never did the work of like trying to do the hard work of where do I turn and what is this connected to that? And all that hard work builds a, a sense of the uh, uh, environment around us. And we just now, let the machines think the space for us so we don't we don't have that space in our heads anymore. And increasingly we let the machines think about how to identify species um, and how to like write papers and answer questions. And all these tools, AI, it's really useful if you've used Seek or you've used AI to do chat GPT or any of these things, they're really fun, useful tools um, that, that I mean, I use every day, but they're also kind of terrifying uh, because, you know, when you hand your hard work over to the machines, uh, you no longer have to do it and you no longer learn that. Um, and so we lose something. And what the machines can't replace is our relationship with the natural world, is our connection to the natural world. And in fact, I think they interfere with it. So this, this book that I wrote um, is about this course. Uh, well, it's a, based on this course that I used to teach. It was sort of my favorite job I'd, I'd ever had. Uh, it's called Field Naturalist. And once a week, we would take the students uh, in a van in the mystery machine and drive out into some random place in the woods. I wouldn't tell them where we were going or in a field or some landscape. And they'd be confronted with a mystery. Uh, some puzzle to solve where they'd have to learn to read the landscape. The landscape. They'd have the day to solve the mystery. Um, and it was, you know, it was really powerful for them, powerful for me, and it's sort of the basis of, of this course. So what do I mean uh, with this book? Uh, what do I mean when I say read a landscape? So I'll give you an example here in, in our backyard. Um, so reading a landscape is about looking at patterns that tell stories and, and telling those stories. So for instance, if you look, there's hemlocks throughout the understory here, but there are no hemlocks in the canopy. So that's a pattern that tells a story. And I'll get back to that in a second. Here's another pattern. If you dig a hole anywhere in our front yard, uh, it just keeps going through that nice soft soil as far as you can reach. Um, you know, it's where our garden grows, but you know, you can't find any rocks there. There are no rocks in our yard, but if you take a walk up the hill behind our house, in about 20 seconds, you'll start passing lots and lots of rocks. There are rocks everywhere. There are, of course, the footprints of the glaciers. When the glaciers melted uh, 10,000 years ago, they dumped this pile of rocks, this glacial till, all across the landscape. That's why farmers 200 years ago had to haul them out of their fields and line their fields with stone walls. So why aren't there rocks in our front yard? Well. When the glaciers melted in this region, they left behind this giant glacial lake. And our house must have been below lake level where for thousands of years, layer after layer of sediment built up and buried those rocks. And, uh, you know, so we sit up here looking out across the valley, imagining we're still looking across that glacial lake. And we say that, you know, our house is beachfront property. It's just that the lake has been gone for 10,000 years. So when you look at these stone walls, you know, the lack of small rocks in them suggests that this wasn't cropland, this was pasture, sheep pasture. Um, and I would have done the same thing, you know, 
keep the garden uh, down in this nice lake bottom soil in our yard and keep the sheep up here in this rocky acidic soil where the glacial till pokes through. Um, up here, you know, you have, uh, there's lots of partridge berries and pines, and uh, you have that same pattern of the hemlocks all in the understory and no hemlocks in the canopy. And this is, of course, the classic success, uh, story of forest succession. When the sheep pasture was abandoned, the winged pine seeds flew out across the fields, and the pines grew up straight and tall, and pines loved the sun, but the thing about pines is they can't survive in the shade of their own canopy. Hemlocks, on the other hand, they're slow growing, they love the shade, and they sit in the understory waiting for the pines to die, waiting to turn this into a hemlock forest. And there's this middle layer of cut stumps next to this, uh, these little birches that tell us, you know, a couple decades ago, someone cut some of the pines making gaps in the canopy where the birches love to grow. So these layers in the soils and the forest, they tell us about the past, they tell us about the future, uh, they tell us, you know, where to plant your garden, where to find the partridge berries and bobcats and fishers. And, and you know, I think if, if decision makers had this sort of uh, awareness of the world around them, I think we'd make better decisions about our landscapes. And for me, you know, it's just a really fun way to connect with nature. And it's a really, you know, compelling stories to tell uh, through this sort of this, this way of connecting and reading landscapes. So let's go on here. Um, so this is our front yard. Um, and in our yard, you know, we control a whole landscape. This over the, the left here is our yard. This was our neighbor's yard, which is what our yard looked like before we moved in. And we, you know, you were probably familiar with uh, sort of wild yard uh, movement to kind of let things go and make a big mess of your yard. But for us, this mess is is beautiful and we love it. And we love all the species that that grow up there. We have this just tangled, complex place. Um, we don't uh, we don't rake our leaves and burn them because, you know, leaves are where the pollinators overwinter uh, and a lot of bugs live in those leaves. And so if we burn those leaves, we're literally just burning the pollinators or throwing them in the in dump in garbage bags. So we just let them sit there. We let them, the bees, you know, live in the old sumac stems. And I love all the little leaf miners and bugs. You know, I went down this whole route with that other book I was talking about with bugs and uh, making tracks and signs on things. And actually, Charlie Eisman, you should go look up. He has, he's way more the lead on this and has done lots of amazing work on galls and leaf mines and stuff. But when you start looking closely at all the things living in your yard, there's a lot of beauty and amazing uh, things happening there. Um, in our yard, we, you know, as you may also try to avoid non-native species, there's a great study by Desiree Narango looking at uh, neighborhoods that had invasive or non-native shrubs planted. And in the neighborhoods where there's more non-native shrubs, uh, the chickadees, you know, the non-native non shrubs have fewer bugs because the, the they left all their, their enemies behind. So in these neighborhoods with lots of non-natives, there weren't enough bugs for the chickadees to find. So the chickadee mamas couldn't get enough to feed their babies and the babies all started yeah, to down, please. Didn't leave, were not able to fledge. Um, so yeah. what we do in our yard controls uh, a lot. And there is a classic example of in Phoenix out in the desert there, these four sort of classic different types of landscape in your yard, either this wild xeric sort of dry landscapes or manicured xeric or these music yards where you're basically trying to recreate Baltimore out in Arizona, or these yards where folks don't have enough uh, resources or income to do much um, in, in their property. And Susanna Lerman looked at the birds and found that each of these yard types uh, supported different species. And the species, the, the yards that were more xeric, deserty like landscapes had more of those birds, uh, the, the desert adapted, you know, curb built thrashers and road runners and, and cactus friends and things that, that sort of are specialist out there in the Southwest. And the yards that were more sort of uh, had less of the desert shrubs had these sort of cosmopolitan uh, pigeons and, and sparrows, uh, house sparrows that, you know, are all over the place in cities. And the interesting thing too was she found that like people really responded to these birds differently depending on what their yard was. So when she was out uh, surveying these uh, these xeric landscapes with the native birds, there she the people would come up to her and be like, "Hey, you're a birder. I love my birds. Hey, can you tell me more? Or what are these birds?" And they just are very excited about it. 
And then in the other yards, she would be walking around. People come up and be like, hey, you're a birder. How, how do I get rid of my, my birds? I hate being, they poop on everything and they're really annoying. Um, and so, you know, we, our values really respond to the species that are out there and, and what we're doing in our yard sort of has this feedback effect. So we care, we care about the ecology there, whether we know it or not. And so, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about how invasives are bad and we want to do just plant natives only. And for one chapter in the book, I spent the winter visiting this abandoned orchard here uh, it, that used to be an orchard, but it sort of was abandoned. And it's been grown over with just, it's just this invasive nightmare of like all the worst sort of noxious weedy species like uh, multiflora rose and privet and bittersweet. And it's just this tangled, horrible mess. Uh, and we were trying, going there trying to get pictures of all the animals that may live there. Um, and the whole winter, there was this massive cleanup effort of, of folks trying to like cut, cut up the bittersweet and clean it up, make it nicer. And, and the whole winter, I kind of wondered if my heart was sort of the only one that broke watching this cleanup. Because the orchard is a place that lives really deep in my heart. For about 11 winters, Charlie and I uh, taught this winter animal tracking course in Western Mass. And we would always start in the orchard for one particular species. When you first set foot in the orchard and you get to this, this is what we call rabbitat, uh, which is like this thick thickets of multiflora rose uh, below which the rabbits live. And down, this was in Massachusetts where there's it's Eastern cottontail there. Um, and the bunnies live in there, they love it. And they sit there all winter. And above the bunnies, there's all these berries and the birds love the berries all winter long. You have these flocks of like robins and, and things hanging out and sort of making all this noise. I remember one one winter we were teaching this course and uh, Charlie was talking to the students about bird language, um, which is this idea that if you listen to the birds, they'll kind of like tell you what's going on in the world in nature. And uh, while he's talking, there's just this, you know, cacophony of robins, this like chattery, chattery, chattery. And all of a sudden they all went quiet and this hush fell over the orchard and we waited. And a minute later, this Cooper's hawk comes gliding low overhead and we're like, aha, that's what the birds were telling us. So, you know, the berries feed the little birds and bunnies, which feed the bigger predators. Um, and, uh, we were out there trying to get pictures of some of those predators on, on Christmas day, it snowed, I don't know, six, eight inches of snow. And uh, we went out there and I went out with Juno, who at the time my son was I don't know, maybe four years old and his little legs couldn't quite like make it through the snow. So I had to like post hole in front of him making the, the tracks and he would sort of step in my tracks, kind of like the way coyotes do. You know, if you're following a trail of coyotes, what you think is one might branch out to be three coyotes. They're all stepping in each other's tracks and they'll even, you know, one coyote will step her back feet into the front feet tracks just to save energy. So Juno looks up to me and says, Dada, you and me, we're coyotes. And I'm like, yeah. And so we get up to the trail camera to see what animals we may have caught. And, uh, you know, I take my laptop and throw it down on the snow and pop the SD card out and, of the camera and put it in the laptop and expect to see a picture of me and Juno walking up to the camera. Uh, but we don't. What we see is this. And on some level, we truly believe that we transformed into coyotes and we howled the whole way back to the car. So Eastern Coyote, it's a modern invention. It didn't exist 100 years ago. It's really, uh, we killed off wolves out here and the Western Coyote moved eastward, interbred with wolves and dogs to some extent and became this sort of bigger, more pack-like thing that's kind of like a, a new species, but now is all over the East. We also got pictures of red fox, also something that was mostly imported for fox hunting around here, although there were some boreal populations with lower densities. Uh, and then we got pictures of gray fox, which is a fully uh, native species. So when Charlie and I were teaching this class, uh, the tracking class, we would uh, spend a lot of time out in the deep woods of Western Massachusetts. And I don't know if you've ever been out there, but there's a lot of great old forest that's just really wonderful. And when you're when we're out like going through the forest, every couple of days or so, we might come across the trail of a bobcat. And we'd be like, aha, our favorite species, let's follow it. So we'd get on that trail and we'd take the class and we'd follow that bobcat trail. And 
inevitably that cat would take us to some horrible thicket, some recent logging cut or overgrown beaver meadow, some place thick and tangled where there's lots of bunnies and lots of cover, some place like the orchard. And it's really bobcats are the reason that we always start in the orchard. It's the one place we can always go and always find sign of bobcats. It's the densest population of bobcats we've ever seen, although it's probably just like the one family that's always there, a couple of cats that just have no reason to go anywhere else because they've got everything they need right there in the, in the orchard. They've got food and cover and they just kind of hang out there. So the same family maybe we've been tracking for you know, 20 years or so. So when you look at the orchard, maybe you see a tangled mess of invasives, or maybe you see the bobcats that you have a relationship with. You know, a mile away from the orchard, there's this famous salamander crossing tunnel. The first tunnel installed in North America for salamanders was like, I think, blown from Europe for hundreds of thousands of dollars or something. Like that. Anyway, it's this spot where every year the um, salamanders cross the road and the community comes out to help the salamanders across the road, either into the tunnel or with the buckets, they kind of help them, help them cross. And it's this, you know, wonderful point of connection between the community and nature. And, you know, it's not like spotted salamanders are really rare. There's probably over 30,000 populations of them in Massachusetts alone. Um, and, you know, on our way driving to this particular spot, we may be squishing other amphibians on the way. It may be, we're not, and we may not be really helping the species as a whole. But what we are doing is connecting, right? When that child holds that individual salamander, which are big and awesome in her hand, she forms a relationship with that individual. And for me, it's, you know, that's what this whole thing is about, is these relationships with individual creatures and individual places and forming that bond uh, that is so important. And that's the thing that made this course, uh, for me, so powerful with the students. Um, and I think the thing that makes, uh, you know, why why I keep doing this. So in, in this course uh, and in the book, you know, we went to these 10 or so different landscapes um, and confronted a mystery at each one of them. Um, and I want to go through one mystery with you right now. And uh, let me, I don't know if this will work right now, but uh, let me just see if I can see the chat. I'm just going to try this. So if you look let me see. I don't know if you can still see my screen there. Stop me if you can't. But when you look at this, um, the first thing to ask is like, do you see a pattern? And if you see a pattern, you could type it in the chat or you could just think to yourself. And if things appear, I'll respond to them. If not, you can just think for a moment what kinds of patterns you see uh, in this landscape and what might be a mystery worth solving. I'm gonna not seeing any chats yet, but that's okay. Very little understory. Yeah, same age of trees. I agree with that. They are sort of similar age of trees. Different ground cover on the different sides of the path. Yeah, Le the different sides, left versus right, there's a difference. And I, that's the one thing I wanna, yeah, more vegetation on the shady side. Okay, it's hard to say the, the shady versus not shady, the contrast is a little funny on the screen. I actually turned it back up for a recent slideshow. Um, but yeah, this difference here, there's dark green and light green, right? So, um, okay, we see a pattern. So now the question is what sorts of processes might cause this? And I see uh, something about north and south slopes. I'm gonna put some more species in the plants in here. These are the things that actually occur on those different sides. Um, and maybe you recognize them, some maybe you don't. I see something that says north and south slopes. So. Okay, what what someone type in there what would what does that mean north and south slopes how does that work Yeah so the sun okay so let me I'm going to go to the next so there's something about the sun uh we can form more more complete thoughts I'm going to go to the next the next slide here yeah south gets more light so I'm going to go to the next slide that shows these species and the actual names of them and where they like to live so so uh, does this make sense? Can we can we put the whole story together in a sentence here as to so how sun and slope and species preferences, how how this works?
Oh, there's a dark box in front of the screen. That's horrible. It might be my chat window. How about that? Does that work better? But then I can't see the chat. Zoom is so much fun. Can you guys see that there? Better, all right, good. So maybe think for a moment as like you look at these species, their site preferences, you think about south and light and all that kind of stuff. And can you form a description in your head of like how the process forms this pattern? All right, so I'm, yeah, so, okay, south slope is dry because it gets more sun. So, all right, so let's, let's, I think we're, we're circling around the answer here, and I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in and, and sort of pull this out. So we're in the northern hemisphere, uh, which means that the sun is always in the southern part of the sky. Anything north of the Tropic of Cancer, if I got that right, um, is, uh, the sun's always in the southern part of the sky, and, you know, especially like at noon, it's noon, true solar noon, the sun is due south. So which means that anything that is on a south facing slope is going to um, get lots of sun. And that sun, right, will dry out those soils. So if, if we look here at the compass, this arrow is north. I don't know if you can still see that if there's still a horrible box in front of your screen there. Hopefully it works. Um, oh, two new messages. Um, so this north arrow, it points to over here. So this must be facing south because this is the north side. So south is on the right side of my screen as I'm looking at it. Uh, and so the sun is coming and beating down on the slope, the sort of lighter green. And you see these species, which are, wait a second, these are the rich, moist, loving species. Wait, then these, the dry ones are on the slope that points north, the ones that like dry. So that, wait, does that, is that backwards? Is that wrong? Wait, that's what it says in the book here. So uh, what's going on there? Well, turns out that it has nothing to do with south versus north, that that's not really what's going on here. Um, to understand this pattern, we have to dig a little deeper here. And I saw some people pointing out some other ideas, including, um, uh, I think I saw a soil type in there somewhere. So I'm gonna go with that. So it turns out that if you see these rocks down here, I don't know if anyone's a geologist out there, but maybe maybe you recognize them. And one thing you can look at is these sharp edges here. They break in a way that suggests that this is basalt. Um, it's something where the crystals didn't have enough time to form when the rock cooled. So that it's just a random, almost glass-like crystalline structure. So when it breaks, it just makes these glass-like sharp edges. Whereas this one over here has these little rock, rounded rocks, which in, in like almost a cement-like matrix, which tells you that this is a conglomerate, sandstone -y kind of conglomerate thing, bunch of stuff that was buried in, in the sedimentary way. And you can actually tell because they're rounded and the colors that that this was uh, uh, the origin of, of those that pile of rock that got turned into, into this conglomerate. So we have two different rock types on these two different slopes. And basalt, what is basalt? It is lava that cooled. So why is there lava here? Well, remember how North America and Africa keep kind of like bumping into each other? The last time they separated, uh, these sort of stretch marks formed in the, in the country, in the continent. And from uh, North Carolina all the way up to sort of into Canada, into these stretch marks, lava started bubbling up into these like 800 foot deep lava lakes. And you can still find these sort of these rift valleys, the remnants of them from North Carolina up all the way up the coast. Um, these lava lakes sort of boiled up and then they kind of cooled, the rifting kind of slowed down for a little bit um, and, and this basalt formed and then some sedimentary rocks piled on top of that and then some more rifting and another layer. So we have these layers of basalt and this conglomerate sort of on top of each other. And the, this was, you know, here we are in one of those rift valleys. And this was going to be the uh, new Atlantic Ocean as the continents separated away from each other. But it turns out this Rift Valley was aborted. And the one that won was, you know, just east of Boston and the coast of Maine, the actual where the Atlantic opened up. And this Rift Valley stopped spreading. And so it had just cooled and it just sat there. Um, and eventually with plate tectonics, these layers of basalt and conglomerate kind of tilted sideways. And then uh, weathering, they kind of like eroded away. But it turns out that basalt is more resistant to weathering than, than, the, than the surrounding uh, 
sedimentary rocks. So this basalt stuck out, uh, and that's what formed this mountain. And what we're looking at here is this crack between basalt and conglomerate. Um, and it turns out the basalt puts a lot of magnesium in the soil uh, and makes for really rich soil. And whereas the sedimentary rock makes for very poor acidic soils. So what we're looking at in this pattern here is it's not the moisture preferences of these plants. It's the preference for rich versus poor or acidic soil. And, you know, we usually think of um, plant, wetland plants as sort of plants having a rich and uh, moist association, rich and moist kind of going together because the plants that are down low live in these sort of moist habitats where all the nutrients are and the plants up on hilltops live in these dry habitats that have been robbed of nutrients. So rich and moist often go together. Uh, but in this case, we sort of um, separated those two things and they're no longer connected. And it's really not the moisture, but the, the richness preference that is that is uh, driving the pattern here. So what we're looking at here, these plants tell us the story of when Africa left North America uh, 200 million years ago. Um, it tells us the story of this whole valley that uh, that all of the sites in the book and in the class take place in. And that's sort of the first layer of the bedrock. And then when you visit each of the other sites, you'll find, you know, as you would in any of your, your landscapes, you'll find different layers of your story um, of whether it's sort of glaciers or fires or land use or you know, rivers moving around or wetlands or uh, the different things that cause patterns on your landscape and the, that form your landscape. So I'm just about at the end, I just want to sort of run through real quick the kind of conceptual way if you walk into your woods or onto your landscape. Uh, so how can you think about like, where do I start? Or what, what is the framework that I, I look at? And, and you know, we kind of think about this, this is handed to me from the UVM Field Naturals program and Tom Sigma at Yale, this sort of pieces pattern process idea. You look at the pieces, you think about the pattern and you think, find, figure out the underlying process. And so some of these processes, which I touched on, you know, you look at the bedrock, the surficial deposits of the geology, the topographic position, the landscape context, what's, what's around you, the disturbance history, whether it's you know, been logged recently or, or not, and then sort of the values that we bring to a landscape. Um, and as I've shown, you know, bedrock, you know, can get tilted and it gets weathered away differentially. Weathering creates the topography we live in, the, the rain come and forms this sort of network of rivers, and then maybe the glacier has dumped all this glacial till on top of it, which for one thing masks the underlying bedrock sort of influence on plants often, and animals, but it also stopped up all those drainage networks, which makes for this landscape with lots of standing water and vernal pools that we have in New England. You know, I come from Tennessee where we brag that there's not a single natural lake in the whole state, except for one lake that was formed in the 19 something earthquake when the Mississippi ran backwards for a day or two, uh, but that's a different kind of thing. But yeah, so down there, the rivers have had so much time to work the landscape and the glaciers don't keep messing it up, that there's a really well-developed drainage network. So we have more standing water um, in our landscapes. You know, when you think about where you are on the, the topography, we talked about um, north versus south slopes. You think about how far you are from the water table, which tends to be just like, you know, in very simplified terms, it's sort of like the same thing as the surface, but more compressed. So if you're up at the top, you have to have really deep roots to get to the water. So chestnut oaks and other hilltop species tend to do better there and are adapted for that kind of environment. Whereas down here, where the sycamores and things grow, you're closer to the water table. Um, here's another example. This is actually north versus south slopes where you have this north facing slope having a really different forest community than the south facing slope there. We think about the disturbance history. Uh, in this case, we have a forest of oaks that you know oaks usually grow in a single stem uh, but if you cut down the oaks, they'll sprout sort of stump sprout from the end, from the two different sides that'll eventually form two big trees. And you can sort of see how big the original tree is by looking at the centers of those two trees. So here we have a forest that was, used to be a forest and was all cut down 100 years ago or so, and then allowed to regrow to a new forest. So you see that in the shape of the split tree. Um, you can look again, we talked about sort of Succession, uh, forest succession is really you know, seeing the different layers from top to bottom of, in this case, the pines first and then the hardwoods underneath. And if you have an early successional forest, you'll see difference in the top and bottom. If you have an old growth forest like this beech forest, you will see that the species at the top are kind of like the same as the species at the bottom. But even in those sorts of forests, you'll see an occasional, this is you know down south, you'll see 
uh, in this beech forest, as uh, so in Tennessee, you'll see a tulip poplar, which are early successional species down there, occasionally one there. And in this case, um, this is, you know, even in, in old growth forests, you have instead of stand level disturbances, you have individual trees that might fall over, create a gap. Uh, and on that soil will sort of erode away and make this mound and these pits next to it when these are places where, you know, lots of trees can only grow on the pit, uh, on the mounds. Uh, and so that you can see from this tulip poplar here, it's sort of like this octopus like legs. There used to be an ancient mound there that it, it grew on. And that's how you have an early succession species in an old growth forest. Um, and in early successional forests, you have more lights, you have more invasive shrubs like this honeysuckle coming in here. And so you look at your disturbance history and you look at your landscape context. Here, that same honeysuckle kind of fringe it, around this field is creeping into what should be this kind of like forest, oaky kind of forest like that, but you can see the, the honeysuckle creeping in from the edge. So all these different processes are just sort of ran through, but you know, on top of it all is, is sort of the values, right? Like how do we, how do we hold this place? What is it we want to see to see from it? And, and how do we, you know, what do we value what we don't, there's no objective re, right answer in conservation biology. It's all value laden. And like with the bobcats in the orchard, um, you may see it in different ways, depending on, on what your goals are. Um, you may see a toppled over tree as a mess, or you may see that there's wood frogs growing in there and it's the best part of the forest because all the old, all the turtles and snakes and overwinter in the pit there and the creatures like to stand on the logs and eat them, the woodpeckers and all the other things. So the values are important. Our understanding of the landscape is important. Um, and it's my hope that, you know, when we when we have the sort of way of seeing the world and decision makers have this way of seeing the world, we'll spend uh, less time just thinking from, as I said, the sort of forest of drywall and uh, thinking from our experience in the real forest. So I want to, uh, I guess I have time, I think, to end with just a quick reading from a book. Maybe it'll take two minutes or so. Um, and this is from uh, one of the early chapters where we're going up to meet that that uh, valley with the two different shades of green facing each other. Uh, and where it's like an early August morning, I think, and, and I've got Juno on my back and sort of hiking up this hill and we're on the trail, but then we decide to leave the trail because following the trail is the easiest way to be lost. Sure, that trail might take us to a preordained destination faster, but we'll have no idea where we are when we get there. While we're on the trail, we lose track of what's around us and where we are in space. We are lost. We put our trust in the trail, ceding responsibility. We give up our awareness, our senses, our minds. Our interface with the landscape boils down to just two numbers, the total length of the trail and the distance we've traveled. Staring at the path a few feet in front of us, we are not fully engaged with the surrounding world. But step off that path and suddenly we have to look up, look at the shape of the land and decide how steeply we wanna climb. Look at the trees in the distance and pick a target to walk toward. Keep looking behind us so that we will recognize the forest when we encounter it from the other direction on our return trip. Study the shrub layer for gaps to duck through, follow the occasional animal trails worn through the denser areas. Use the network of deer paths when traversing steep slopes to gain level footing. Keep an eye out for poison ivy, rose thorns, and ticks waving their arms in hopes of catching a ride. Study the patterns of light for clearings. Monitor the changing habitats near and far. White tops of sycamores in the distance signaling a creek. Chestnut oaks nearby telling us we've reached the drier hilltops. The banjo-like of a lone green frog calling from the wetland ahead that we hope to steer around. Keep an eye on the rising sun and remember where south is as we walk. This whole time, we maintain a map of the landscape in our heads, filling in the details as we go. That is how we get to know the world and our place in it. So uh, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and take any questions. That was great, Noah. I I just read that section last night when I picked when I picked up your book again, and I I, I really loved it. I love the sentiment in that, and um, and it 
it leads me to a question, which is, um, so for people who aren't, you know, as, um, you know, anywhere near as, as knowledgeable as you are about sort of what clues mean, you know, what do you suggest for someone who hasn't spent a lot of time outdoors, you know, what's the best way for them to, you know, what kind of patterns are, you know, I don't know, I, you know, you can look at patterns and understand them, but, you know, what do you suggest for someone who doesn't have a whole lot of background in the natural world? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I think starting by just going outside and, and just getting to know some of your species and creatures or looking at your door and seeing what bugs are there, right? Just the first getting to know if you, the, the things around you. I think there's, if you're in a forest, right, or you have access to a forest, that's like sort of some easy kind of like first step things to kind of look at, which are like, uh, as I said, the the layering in the forest, right? Looking for successional patterns. So if you see trees and maybe you don't even know their species names, but if you look at the canopy and you see one type of species and you look in the understory and you see a different type of species, that tells you that the forest is still in transition. It hasn't reached stability if that ever is a thing. Um, so looking at layering differences from top to bottom is, is a great place to start. Um, and, uh, you know, and you can, then you start to look at sort of these same sorts of patterns as you go away from a field, you see changes in that. Um, and then I think the other thing is, you know, once you key out a couple of species, uh, going and reading about the habitat preferences is a really great thing to do. And you start to understand like, you know, chestnut oaks or whatever, where you are on the hill top versus the down low and starting to understand which species grow near water, away from water, um, and those sorts of things. And, you know, uh, one of the things too I like to do is if you're in an urban landscape, uh, often there's a couple trees that are really like wetland indicators, like um, like silver maple and, and uh, 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 sycamore, and depending where you are, um, or sweet gum down south or whatever, but some of these were wetlandy kind of trees, two blows up here. Um, and if you're in an urban landscape, often you'll find those in like this place that is like not uh, like an old, like like silver maple and it's next to a sycamore in some like bike path or something. And you'll have some sense that, oh wait, this when this was a forest or before we put a like a trail, a bike path here or something like this was what the landscape was like hundred years ago, 200 years ago. And this is kind of what it wants to be. Um, so I don't know, those are a couple of things that, to think about. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have other questions, but. Um, I would just invite folks to put any questions they have in the chat or people are welcome to unmute and ask them directly. Um, I yeah. Can I jump in? Sure. <laughs> Hi. Um, the comments about, you know, getting off the trail, the trouble is in a lot of our preserves, if a lot of people did that, it would be so damaging. I understand the concept, but it's amazing if you just take a look around you as you're walking on a trail and depending where you are, it's amazing how much it can change as you're going along. Um, you know, I, even some of our local preserves, Dodge Point is a perfect example where, you know, you go to, along the, the old roads and you can tell that there was farming there at one time, but there's also areas where you're in a total different forest. And that happens in quite a lot of places we can go hiking in this area. I think we're pretty blessed that way. Um, and I think if people can definitely still stay on the trails and not do damage to the whole landscape and yet get a real sense of the differences. I, I yes, I agree. And and there's so there's an there's a tension here, inherent tension. I and there's part of me that that's completely like I hate seeing those trampled landscapes. And like I'm working in Acadia National Park with my grad students doing stuff there. And you know, I absolutely in these like heavy traffic areas where there's you know, trails and especially national parks and preserves where we're trying to protect landscapes, people going off and stepping in like alpine ecosystems and all sorts of things really changes the nature of the forest or nature of the landscape that we're looking at and has a bad, bad impact and from my perspective and yours too, I think. Um, I think that, you know, but there is a tension in the same way that like the best thing that we can do sort of for the environment is to all move to cities and like never drive and just like walk around, but then we lose our connection to the natural world and it sort of becomes this like 
like I don't like living in a city. I want to live out in the woods, but then I have to drive to get places. And so um, there is a tension in like our experience of the world and and the way our experience of nature and like our like protecting it. Um, I think that there are landscapes where you can responsibly really go off trail and maybe not everybody, but like people that, you know, have land or that there's, you know, a lot of types of land, um, forests like uh, uh, you know, state forests and other places that are meant for uh, resource extraction and stuff where really going off trail hunting and all sorts of things is encouraged and as part of the pur purpose of the land use um, sort of isn't these high traffic preserve kind of areas. I, I would separate a preserve from a uh, sort of resource extraction conservation area. So I think, you know, responsibly finding the places where you're not going to damage a fragile ecosystem and finding the ways that you can wander and get to know a landscape without negatively impacting it and without being with a million other tourists who are doing the same thing. I think there's a balance there and there's a tension, but I, I think I, I agree with you. Um, so. Yeah. Um, Nicholas, do you want to ask your question? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thank you. That was so fascinating. Um, I was going to say, um, just when you were talking about the, uh, the, the thicket around the old apple orchard and how it's sort of a mess of, you know, these horrible invasive species, and I was reflecting on my own, you know, yard and um, trying to be a, a good steward of it and, you know, in small ways, my little quarter acre here. But, um, you know, we have lots of rose multiflora and um, Eurasian bittersweet and um, whatever the shrub is with the little gray berries. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, and, you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm hoping maybe you can tell me there's another way to think of it as just, you know, this, this mess that I need to do battle with constantly. And it sort of brings me to a, a little, a quick anecdote. I won't keep it too much, but um, just I remember last spring about this time of year, seeing a great big um, flock of cedar wax wings descend on the rose multiflora and, you know, eating the berries and feeling very conflicted because I, you know, love them and think they're beautiful, but also like, you know, thinking of all those little seeds getting distributed throughout the landscape and having, you know, even more of this Eurasian bittersweet. So just your thoughts on that, I'd, I'd love. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, it's a, this sort of tension, right? Like, and it depends on how we hold the landscape. And there, you know, in conservation biology, in, there's this recognition these days that that there is no there is no nature absent humans. There's no pristine nature left on Earth. Every place is impacted by people. Every place will be different in the future than it was in the past. And there's going to be novel land, novel ecosystems that there is no analog for. We can't look to the historical record and say this is this is we're creating new ecosystems and everywhere is kind of touched by people. Um, and, you know, this idea of just trying to hold on to the past in every instance and trying to hold some pristine like 1492. Well, there were people here in 1492 too, maybe 10,000 years ago. I mean, like there's no pristine real objective past to hold on to. Um, so we have to kind of take what we're given and figure out like, what are the our values in that? What do we want to do with this place? And in some places, like invasives may be like the best, you know, best use of a land. Like if it's already there, if there are birds that are using it, if the bobcats are using it, if it has some value for the species that are of value to you and the local um, folks, then then there's value in it as it is. And, and sort of the question you have to ask yourself is if you were to do something there, what would be the alternative? Like um, you would have to like mow it all down and replace it with an old growth forest or like, it's kind of like, it's not clear how you would get, move that into a new trajectory that would, without an enormous amount of energy, like actually be better for the world as opposed to kind of keeping it for what it is and then valuing it. Um, minimizing of course like the spread of, of invasives into like old growth forests that haven't yet been touched um i, I don't know I, I don't have answers but i like i think there's a a lot of different ways you can hold that and look at it and you kind of like always have to come back to like you know it's not necessarily bad in isolation it's like what are your options here like that that orchard right it's like they were going to clean up all the invasives but what were they going to replace it with like just a lawn that is all like eurasian grassy things so it's not really a native thing anyway so like let's let the bobcats and birds play I don't, I don't know so you know so i think yeah so it's sort of uh you have to see all the different layers of interaction and of course like yeah multiple rose is going to host less bugs less 
uh, it's part of, of the gall making insects and the leaf miners that are going to support fewer of the native birds. So there's less of that, but maybe the birds overwintering with the berries is something. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I have also heard that um, the berries on multiflora rose and maybe some of the others are a little bit like junk food, sort of like eating McDonald's for every, sure. every meal and that there's less nutritional value, but so yeah, yeah. And if you are sitting there with a choice, like, oh, I could buy the multiflora rose and plant it, or I could propose like a like possum haw or some local native species, like, yeah, plant the native one, right? Like, that's an easy choice when you actually can are in a position to to choose between those two things. I think we're often not in that position, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree. Um, let's see. There's a comment from. Benjamin says Southern California is like that in urban environments. So many non-natives, only four na 14 native tree trees in SD County, but over 300 species present here now. So now mm -hmm. it's a bit of viewing it as good non-natives and bad non <laughs> and bad non-natives. Yeah. yeah, that's I true. Think this grow real fast. <laughs> Do others have questions or? Sorry. I think it looks like people, I would just strongly encourage everybody to um, uh, try to get a copy of, um, of Noah's book. I've read it and I really loved it. There's just, there's, um, there's so much, um, so much information in the, in it and um i mean i read it once and then i immediately thought i'm gonna have to read read it again um someone asked if you hold in-person tracking classes um i would love to we haven't done it recently it's we part of it charlie and i have both had kids recently which kind of makes tracking harder <laughs> uh, little people but um maybe at some point they I would love to teach some tracking. I mean, I I have taught a tracking course last year through the University of Maine, um, but uh, not I haven't done as much as I want to be doing. So, so yeah, and it's well, probably snow, but we haven't had enough snow recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good cue for us. We can uh, the land trust can look into trying to have some kind of a tracking workshop. I'm sure there are people yeah. who um, are good yeah. trackers. Oh, yeah. So. Great. Well, thank you so much, Noah, for sharing your time with us tonight. And thanks, everybody, for showing up. And um, we have one copy of Noah's book at the Ecology Center. If people want to go and just take a look at um, look at it, um, I'm sure the libraries have copies. So, um, And I just put that code again in the chat if somebody was, you know, that would be helpful. Yeah, I can. And I will email that out to folks yeah. along with the links that Noah put in there um, to folks tomorrow. That's great. Thank you for that well, general. Just, yeah. That's awesome. It's a lot of fun. And thanks for, you know, it seems like great work. And, and so happy that all of you could come and hang out for a little bit. So, Well, thank you for the work that you're doing. It's uh, It sounds like it's really wonderful work. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Take thank care. You. All. All right. Bye-bye.